Uh, yeah, the arsler is used a lot in old movies. Yes. And 90s TV shows. <laughs> oh, there we go. I was like, hang oh, on. Oh, yeah, that comes arsler. up a lot, too. Yeah. Took a minute. Uh, I was like, racist? That's not, no, hang on, wait. I went in a completely wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, and Batman said it. In one of the, in, in the infamous "I'm the goddamn yeah. Batman," uh, right panel was that Frank Miller? It feels like Frank Miller. It was Frank Miller, yeah. It was uh, Frank yeah, Miller. That's why with the worst rendition of Batman ever, which is too bad because he had a couple of better renditions before. I that. watched Linkara do a rundown of that series, and it was offensively bad. Oh yeah, yeah, because he did like an issue by issue of it of All Star Batman, and it's offensive that that was written and published by dc like book to book offensive hated it um so if you ever want to be mad it's there for you i don't know anything about frank miller he was a gifted writer and then he turned into like a pile of balls Uh, i think he reached that point of gazing too far over the edge and just becoming a shitlord I can see that. Like, I wonder if Garth Ennis has gone that far yet. I don't know. Like, I have trouble keeping track. I just assume anyone in comic books who's, like, over the age of 50 is a horrible person. (laughs) Damn. Uh, I mean, I like to think that there are exceptions, and I'm sure there are, but... Every time I've been to a comic book panel at a convention with people that are older or people who entered the industry before like 2000, it's been miserable. It's been absolutely miserable. I may just have a bad sample size. I don't know. Um, But like, I think to get there and to survive in the industry uh, in or before the 90s, you pretty much had to be comfortable with a lot of bad things. Oh, I have a counterpoint. Kurt Busiek. Cool. Yeah. I, I'm happy for those. Like, I'm glad that they exist. Yeah. Like, Kurt Busiek I just, I wrote... feel like, especially if you were working at DC or Marvel, um, things were terrible for you. Yeah. And Kurt Busiek wrote Marvels is where he first, like, popped up on a lot of people's radars. And um, I think... To, Astro to City. And uh, one of the best Superman stories ever written uh secret identity oh my god if you haven't read secret identity you have to it's not about superman it's about a guy in the real world who lives in kansas and his parents last name was kent and they thought it would be funny to name him clark and so he has to grow up with that shit and then it turns out he has superpowers and it's all it's it's the classic like astro city making this real but it takes place again in the real world where superman like he has to constantly endure getting superman presence and whatnot because his name is clark kent and throughout college people introduce him to people named lois and lana and whatnot and he's like uh, and like i said he turns out i hate you all turns out he has superpowers and it's it's really good it's good um and reply to the chat um, I think Gail Simone's rise of an influence is the thing that's why I don't think automatically that people who've come into the industry in the last 20 years are awful. Um, Gail Simone was kind of one of the turning points in that. Um, again, I know there are some exceptions from before, but my default is negative and I'm happy to be won over when people don't suck. I've actually never but read that anything that Gail Simone ever wrote just because I don't read comics anymore. Yeah, Gail Simone um, is definitely on the positive end of the spectrum of that. Yeah. I followed her on Twitter for about a week, and then she tweets too much. I had to unfollow her. (laughs) I was like, Jesus Christ, you are three quarters of my feed, lady. Yeah, I've got a couple of accounts that I've muted because of that. It's like, I like this person. I don't want to unfollow them, but I can't. I just can't. So you're getting a timeout. (laughs) 
<laughs> Ow. Um. Oh, uh, Serene Chaos, I did see it in the Discord. Thank you for, for posting that. And that's that's quite a thing. Oh, man, the other thing that I've been doing lately to eat up time is reading comics. Yeah. I read... Christ, uh, just recently, I read Crisis on Infinite Earths, and then Armageddon 2001, which no one remembers, and it's fine. Uh, then I read the, the Death of Superman, the Funeral for a Friend storyline, the Return of Superman, or the Reign of the Supermen. Uh, I read Green Lantern losing his shit, and Kyle Rayner getting the ring. Like, like Zero Hour or something? or What? No, before that. Okay, Green Lantern loses his shit a lot. Right after, so during the reign of the Superman, Coast City got destroyed. Yeah. And immediately thereafter, that's when uh, Hal Jordan lost his shit and decided to absorb the central power battery. And there was one ring left and the one guardian that survived gave it to Kyle Rayner and was like, here. Got it. Okay. And then... I, I read Zero Hour, and now I'm almost done with all of my Zero issues, because I bought almost all of the Zero issues. And some of those are really good, and others are like, what the fuck is this? Fair. Uh, I'm on the Shit. Batman comics now. Which, something I never noticed, so spoilers, I guess. In Robin Zero... Robin and Nightwing are hanging out and shooting the shit and talking about the past and Two-Face and whatnot. And then at the very end, Dick Grayson is putting on the Batman suit while Bruce stands there watching. And he's like, I I can't replace you, but it's going to be a blast standing in for you. But then in the four Batman Zero books, Bruce is still Batman. And I'm going, I never noticed that that disconnect before. Uh And that's basically the last DC comics I ever bought was Zero Hour. So I don't know what they did after that. And uh, I don't I don't know which of those is right. Because like the Batman Zero comics are all about Batman like reaffirming being Batman. And then in Robin Zero he's like, alright, Dick, you take over. And I'm going, wait. Hang hang on. Wait. Wait. And I, I just... <laughs> I don't know. I can never keep track of DC comics. Like Marvel comics. I mostly could keep track of because Marvel has this bad addiction to do their giant, you know, worldwide crossover every year. So you could kind of just categorize things between big, stupid events. Um, and there were so many of them that you could do that, but I have been mad at Marvel comic books for a very long time for repeatedly making bad character choices. So I just kind of stopped. Like, I, I appreciate the characters from Marvel a lot, and I'm glad that I have other media that I can consume them in now. But I, I've hated most of the editorial decisions that have happened involving anything from Marvel for the last, like, 20 years. Onslaught was his name, yeah. I bought a bunch of the big crossover series before Onslaught, but then Onslaught was across everything, and yeah. I just couldn't. Scott has all of those in a box somewhere. But I that's when the <laughs> giant company-wide crossover became a yearly event, was after Onslaught, and I just, I just couldn't you had, um, I, I think it really kind of started when they did, um, was it Age of Apocalypse? Yeah, but, but that, that was, was still weird. mostly just the X-Men comics. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think um, because Onslaught was like, I'm going to kill the Avengers and the Fantastic Four and whatnot, and then they get their side crap books that nobody likes. And I just started the, and now everyone gets affected by everything every time thing. Yeah, like, I have several of the big crossover events that are just like, like, Age of Apocalypse is just X-Men. Maximum yeah. Carnage was just Spider-Man. Uh, Galactic, Operation Galactic Storm was just Avengers comics. Like, the, the crossover events that happened in those were, like, way... Yeah more contained so it was possible to get the ball but yeah onslaught is where it just branched out to the entire marvel series and i went no because like the closest thing that happened before that was like 
Secret War, and that was forever ago. And yeah, Secret Wars was in the no one cared eighties. Like, yeah. Yeah, and like yeah, Infinity like, well, Gauntlet. That often. Like, I don't have any of the crossover stories that go with Infinity Gauntlet, just the Infinity Gauntlet. And it's fine. It makes perfect sense. I don't even know if it did a lot of crossover stuff. Uh, I know Infinity War had some crossover stuff, but most of it was just... Like, they weren't necessary. They were just expounding on what was going on in the miniseries. It yeah. would give more of that character's perspective. So it Marvel still it wasn't did their big event mini series, and then you'd have ripples of it in all the other books. Yeah, um, but it wasn't required that you read them all. Yeah, it was it was ripples, as opposed to like when they did um, Civil War, where everyone had to be on one of the two teams, no matter which book you were, and there were like a hundred and five books by the end of it, and no satisfying conclusion. Yeah, people have told me. That it's possible to just read like this this series and this series and get Civil War, and I went, I'm good. I mean, I read all of Civil <laughs> War. It's not worth it. Exactly. Yeah. It's just not worth it. It's not good. Yeah. Once I'm done with the zero issues, I've also got the four so I've got two of the Batman books and then the four Superman books, uh, zeros, and I'm done. With the zero issues. That's where they introduced Conduit, who was supposed to be the next big thing, I guess. He was like Clark Kent's like rival growing up. And he went on to become a supervillain who somehow had kryptonite somehow. I don't know. After the initial run with him, he sort of vanished because no one cared. Yeah. <laughs> I think. But uh, then it's Superman Doomsday Hunter Prey which was the follow-up when Doomsday came back to life. Doomsday oh, suffered the host, so Fuji. hard from being a character that was built to do one thing. And then after doing that thing, they're like, well, let's let's try that some more. <laughs> Just keep well, trying that. Like, the Hunter Prey was when he comes, like, Superman's like, wait, what happened to Doomsday's body? Damn it! And he goes looking for it. And finds out that he's alive again and learns about his past. And then they drop him at the end of time where Entropy kills him. And that should have been the last time anyone ever heard of Doomsday. And then somehow he came back and was smart and could talk and shit. And I'm like, that's not, that's a whole new character. Yeah, it's different. I remember trying to explain Doomsday to one of my friends once. And... They're like, okay, so what's the plan? I'm like, all right, so if you give two babies a knife between them, whichever baby kills the other baby, you make a copy. And then you do this a million times and they have the ultimate murder baby. And then you put that murder baby with a knife and a cage with a tiger. And if the tiger wins, you clone the tiger a million times until it can murder the biggest tiger. And you keep doing this a billion times until you have something that can kill Superman. And they stared at me and they're like, no, really, what is it? And I'm like, that's the plot. Except it was always the baby. It was always the baby. But like, we just, we go with the baby that lasts the longest and we keep cloning it until we make the ultimate baby. It's just yeah. dumb. Like, <laughs> like back then. And it turns out the twist is that this took place on an ancient krypton uh but back then krypton was horribly inhospitable and so they'd shoot the baby out and it would die and then you'd go out and pick up scraps and reclone it and they'd shoot the baby out and it would die and they go out and pick up scraps and reclone it and then eventually it got to where it wouldn't die and then the monsters would uh eat it because it was there were horrible critters on ancient krypton and like the first time it was, it stood up and they were in, and they were like, it's fighting back. And then it died and they went out and, and they kept recloning it until it could survive the atmosphere and fight off the monsters. Cause apparently dying and recloning it made it stronger somehow. It's because he's the winner of a roguelike. Oh, I get it. It's, it's just a, a new run. Market. Okay. That makes a lot more sense now, actually. And so when, when you get in the, the ultimate boss of your roguelike is killing Superman. Yeah, 
And that's actually what they called it was the ultimate. That's that's what the the guy who made it called it. And eventually it got to where it nothing could kill it and it wandered around the entire planet killing all those horrible critters until it found its way back to the place where they made it and it somehow remembered dying all those millions of times. It's not a good story. And it got pissed off and and broke in and killed everybody and then hitched a ride on the supply of ship that came to visit and started terrassing its way through the universe until eventually someone beat it, wrapped it up, and launched it out into space and ended it up on Earth. And for some reason, thousands if not millions of years later, it woke up and was like, what the fuck? And broke out and killed Superman. What? Doomsday's entire purpose was to sell the death of Superman. Yeah. <laughs> but then, and as just a nothing that came out of nowhere and killed Superman, it was perfect. And then for some reason, they decided to do this backstory thing. Gotta explain it now. Yeah, they did the it thing that you're not supposed to do. Like... Yeah. And yeah, and every time that he came up after that, Doomsday, that is... It was weirder and weirder and weirder. I looked up all of his uh, appearances once. And after the second one, I was just going, what is this? What is this? There are plenty of things that could kill Superman, but they went with Doomsday instead. <laughs> Clues, that is brilliant. <laughs> when I When I just lost my crap a minute ago, that's what that was. Would you care to share what, to tell hilarious. tell the, the viewers what the hell? This is? <clears throat> yeah. So for uh, for for the folks who are not following along in the chat and can't follow the links that I post there, uh, so a buddy of mine from Atomic Empire in Durham, North Carolina, it's a great shop. You should check it out. Uh, just posted a thing to Twitter, and it's a screenshot of somebody's uh, uh, Twitter feed where it's conversation between them and a student, and the student asks, "Is there anything I can do to bring my grade up?" And the person responds, "Face me in single combat." And the student says, I was thinking like an extra credit paper. And he goes, here is the sword. So that's... Hashtag grading. That's that's <laughs> about right. That's about right. I only, I only had a couple of requests for, is there anything I can do to salvage my grade at this point this semester? So I only had to send out a couple of disappointed emails. Ah. <sighs> <laughs> Advice, never ask your uh, instructors this question, ever. If there's nothing in the syllabus about extra credit, don't ask, because we don't offer it. Especially don't wait until the very end if you are going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. And my standard response is that what I need you to do is to build a time machine, go back in time, and do better on the other things, because that's, that's how you do it. I would give an A to anyone who built a time machine. That's right. If you can do that, you're getting the A. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah, no matter what. I don't care what class it is. I do not consider it cheating if you go back in time and tell yourself the answers. <laughs> don't let causality be the reason you only got a C. That's right. Try harder. Lord. Uh... Save scumming is a perfectly valid strategy. So Pinball said, you remember when Wolverine had no origin and now he's got like 12? I actually have origin. I have the original issues. Oh, yeah. And it was... I remember at the time when when I got to the issue where the claws first popped, it, it knocked my dick in the dirt. I was like, what? And then the rest of the story, I don't remember because I haven't gotten to that in my reread of my entire comics boxes yet. But, like, I remember the story being not great. It's a period piece. And you find out Wolverine, which one is Wolverine? Because it's a mystery at the beginning. You think it's this or that. And no, it's that. What? And then I just remember being, when it was over, I was like, okay. I mean, when I was a kid and getting into X-Men, a lot of characters didn't have backstories. We didn't know who Rogue was. And didn't need to know. <laughs> and it, I think it was more fun that way. Like, I know that's the lazy answer because mm -hmm. whatever you come up with is going to be better than what they do because you, you're you going to like whatever you came up with. Hi, um, Jen! 
but I, I do feel like most of the time when comic book writers try to fill in the gaps, they just make mistakes. It's very seldom going to be satisfying. Yeah. The, um... I... I, I think I liked it better before they decided to fill in gaps for literally everybody all the time, forever and ever I'm in. Yeah. Like, I still don't know Gambit's deal. And I still don't know if he is the one that Bishop talked to in the future and came back and he was like, you! And Gambit's like, what? And I don't want to know. I'm I, good I never Gambit finding that out. bit by a radioactive Cajun. I think that's where he got his powers. <laughs> uh, that was Fatal Attractions, I think, wasn't it? excellent wait that was was that where magneto took out the adamantium that was graphic as hell it was yeah but was that that. was that the was that the the crossover was that the story nobody remembers no i i remember this the comic where it happened i don't remember what it was called like i think anyone who's ever seen the adamantium getting ripped off as skeleton remembers that like you don't forget that it was Fatal Attractions. Damn, I'm good. I don't. I never even read that. I just. That's one of those things that I know. Yeah. Yay. Wolverine seventy five. Yeah. Wow. Is that all? Cause I had like forty eight, forty nine, and fifty. Cause that was a storyline. And then episodes, issues after that, I had because they were parts of crossovers. I didn't realize it was that soon after those. Damn. I guess that's two so, years. My major problem with comics right now is that I have three long boxes worth of comics and I don't know what the hell to do with them because none of them are actually worth anything because I was collecting comics in the 90s and none of those were worth anything. So I use my comic long boxes to hold up other boxes. Yeah. I don't, I don't just want to, you know, recycle them because I would feel bad doing that, but they're not actually worth anything. So I can't really sell them either. So they just take up space. That's why I'm reading mine because otherwise it's literally just taking up space. And I decided this year, you know what? I'm reading all of that shit. Thus far, I've made it through one and a quarter of my four long boxes. It also became a reorganization, which is what's taking so long. Hey, Pinball, I like Spider-Man 2099. Dude, yeah, yeah. Miguel, Miguel, was that his name? Yeah, Miguel O'Hara. Because yeah. he was, yeah. that's that's what multiculturalism uh, was in the 90s. That's what they thought it would be in 2099, was give him this first name and this last name. Boom! Yeah. I, I was like, I mean, mm. like, I, I like Spider-Man 2099. I liked the, um, the crossover where they... Where, like, the two of them, like, him and Peter Parker get swapped and neither one knows why. Um, so, like, Peter Parker is way out of his debt in 2099. <laughs> where he's just like, wow, there's plenty of room to swing up here. There's cars everywhere. He feels like he's stuck in traffic. Because he's trying to swing around in the skyscrapers and there's just flying cars everywhere like a Batman Beyond scene. And he's terrified and he's just, like, stuck to the wall and he's like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. <laughs> and that's just great. Now, uh, Chewy, in defense of uh, the Spider-Man 2099 character name, are you familiar with a historical figure named Bernardo O'Higgins? No. Okay, so I I only came to know about Bernardo O'Higgins when I went to Chile on uh, astronomical-related tasks uh, years ago. There are gobs of things in Chile named after Bernardo O'Higgins, and he was... uh, he was big in the Chilean War of Independence, and uh, he was Spanish and Irish by descent. Nice. So, Bernardo O'Higgins. I'm going to be right back. You guys keep talking. And if we refuse, and he's already gone. Piss. <laughs> Possibly. Ah, I see what you did there. See? See what I did there? Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, I, always, I never read much Doom 2099. I have a couple issues. But it always seemed weird to me that Dr. Doom somehow made it to the future. I don't know if he is the real Doom or not. And again, I don't want to know. That was the big mystery at the time, though. 
because he believed he was Doom, and other people were like, all right. And <laughs> I was like, didn't Doom have a time machine? Wouldn't he know this shit? Hmm. Nope, I don't want to know. I'm good. Hmm. There was a crossover. I read the first story arc of X Men 2099. That was pretty cool. And there was a crossover between all of them called Fall of the Hammer that had to do with uh, Norse gods or Norse god analogs in 2099. That I think I have all... It was a five-parter. It went through, I think, X-Men and Spider-Man and Doom and Ravage and... I'm missing one, Punisher. I think it went through those five. And I have all of those, but I don't remember anything about that at all. Other than it existed. I have a lot of random comic book storylines where I would, like, read part four and be like that's pretty good and eventually i would amass the other you know one through five to go with it and some of them i didn't and it pisses me off while i was going through my spider-man stuff i found like parts three and six of one where the final issue is a big ass team up with like everybody it's like everybody it's got spider-man and the punisher and moon knight is there and some, uh, uh, I think Daredevil. It's, it's called <laughs> Round Robin, the sidekick's revenge. And the final issue is this giant gatefold cover where, where it's a big ass splash for those all of those characters. And I was like, this is awesome! And it turns out I have part six and I have part like four. And that's it. And I went, fuck, I never bought all of these. And it bothers me. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I think we, I think we all have regrets. I mean, I could probably find them all now for just a few bucks if I were to, willing to go to a comic shop. But sure, the comic shops around here, uh, Sailfish, S A I S S A I L, is it Sailfish or is it S A L E Fish? I can't remember. But there's two of them around here, and I've been in both of them, and they're run by assholes, or at least they were years ago, enough to make me never go back. Comic shop, Bill. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize how lucky I was when I was a kid that there was a uh, a comic shop in downtown Lexington run by the sweet old guy. And then later, in the same space, there was one run by a, a sweet young guy named Blake. Hmm. And he wasn't like a horrible gatekeeper nerd. And I never ran into horrible gatekeeper nerds in there. And that's yeah. where I bought comics for years. Other than the grocery store, because you could do that back then. Oh yeah, they, they had that that like spinny wire rack thing that Did had they all the comics in it. Guaranteed that your comic books would be bent just so. Yep. Oh no! At, at the the food line where I bought them, they were in like under the magazines. Oh. So yeah, that uh, was where like the gas stations were the ones where I encountered the bendy thing. And more. Uh, the drug stores. Yeah, those yeah. too. Because if they didn't have something at the the uh, that I wanted at the uh, food line, I would run across to I think it was not Rite Aid. It was before that. Uh, Bill, you live around here. What's Packard? one of the old? Car drugs. No. Um, oh, crap. Oh well, I'd go to the drugstore and turn the spinny rack. The spinny rack was the only place that sold DC comics. The drugstore, the the grocery store only sold Marvel. That's why m the vast majority of my comics are Marvel. <laughs> that makes sense. Eckerd's. I mean, I used that was comics. it. It was Eckerd. It was Eckerd. Okay. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, I I had a really good comic shop in my hometown when I was a kid. It was All Star Comics and Cards, and it Ooh. was uh, baseball cards and comic books, and it was great. It was run by an old guy who chain smoked all the time because you could just smoke back then in in stores uh, they sure did and i i think as i recall like a little over half the store was comics but it was a pr pretty close to a 50 50 split but it seemed like he made all of his money selling baseball cards and collectible cards 
Um, this was in the years, you know, well before Magic the Gathering or Pokemon or any of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, that was that was a great, that was a great, uh, great shop. That's where I got most of my comics when I was a kid. I mean, except for the ones at the grocery store and the spinny rack there. Yeah. But yeah, these days I would suggest Atomic Empire in Durham, North Carolina, because it is also a comic shop. Yeah. I remember the last time that we went, Bill, is when Clues and Jen were playing Legacy. And yeah. we went to, to meet them and hang out. And while they were playing, we were just walking around the trade paperbacks going, holy shit, do you remember this? Yeah. That was a good night. <laughs> I, I appreciate that Atomic devoted the front half to just random collectible nonsense and gaming stuff. And you can just walk around and look at things, and that's great. Um, yeah, when I was a kid, um, there it's still there. Like I know it's still there because I saw it like a year ago. Um there's this place it's like it's a card shop it's for collectibles and cards and stuff like it's mostly for sports though um but it's like five minutes from my parents house and the next town over and um the places you you walk in it's one of those super crowded like you know you can't move more than necessary to get through the aisles because it's just super crowded like if there was a fire we'd all die yeah kind of places um but it's all sports stuff, like the big glass cases with like baseball cards. Um, I'm in North Carolina, so like NASCAR stuff for days. Yeah. Diecast cars, all of that. A really old um, pinball like cabinet that has um, one of those paddle flipper baseball games in it. Yep. Um, got one of those. Stuff is stacked and stacked and stacked. Um, but anyway, like I went there as a kid and got like my Marvel masterpieces and stuff like that. But when I big. Or like when I went back, like you know, college age, um, they had like Magic the Gathering cards from like the mid to late '90s in long boxes and stuff like that. And I would just go in there, like in the summer, and spend like five hours digging through the commons and uncommons for stuff. And that's where a lot of my collection came from. It's just random stuff from the whole history, like nothing worth money, but just you know, the, the common long boxes that have just been there forever. And um, the place also had the best deal on actually buying magic packs because the way that, that it worked was um, he would give you seven packs of current magic set for 20 bucks. And this was when they were MSRPing at $4. Nice. So I would go up there with a 20, give them a 20, flat 20, get seven packs I could pick and choose from all the different boxes he had things going back at the time Ravnica through whatever the current set was or you could get a booster box off of him for like a hundred bucks and I bought a bunch of stuff through him um but that was where I got one of my master sets um but it was really weird because you know how I just said how crowded that place was yeah he started hosting like pre-releases when they allowed small stores to do them and there's no room for that. So his pre-releases were at picnic tables outside next to the gas station. Wow. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> Sitting on wooden picnic tables outside in the sun. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> but yeah, I never went to his pre-releases, but I, I appreciate that. <laughs> just as a thing to exist. Um, crazy nonsense. Hmm. Oh my yeah. God, there was also Ray's. Ray's Comics and Collectibles. That was next to Scott's house. And Scott uh, and We I... are talking about the same place, Wolfie, just so you know. <laughs> we, uh, we used to walk through the woods and come out uh, at Scott's house, I, I would like spend the night with him on the weekend. We would walk through the woods and come out on the other side uh, of Ray's and walk around back to the shopping center and uh, and hang out with Ray. And Ray was the old chain smoking uh, guy who would tell just outlandish, bizarre stories. Uh. And, and nonsense 
and we would buy packs of magic and occasionally comics from them or from him and then eventually his son took over and his son was kind of a dick but he still was you know it was still worth going there and then we like went to college and whatnot and eventually Ray shut down it was very sad Wow, I'd forgotten all about Ray's. That was before, like, we could drive. So we would, like I said, we'd walk through the woods. It'd take, like, half an hour to go buy some magic cards. Hmm, <laughs> good times. Yeah. Yeah, I remember going to actual comic book stores when I was in, like, middle school and digging through the long boxes in the back and whatnot. Um, but it wasn't ever really the same. Like, like it was neat, but I, I never was the person who had, like, a pull list or anything like that. I, I never went that far into it. I just liked going to places and buying stuff off the shelf. Um, although I do remember... In Raleigh, there's a shop called Foundation's Edge, and it's really old. It's next to NC State. And um, that place has been there forever. I have no idea how old that place is, but it's been there forever. But I had a lot of fun when I was still a student going through the really, really old comics that they have in the way back. And that was when I got some of the old comics that were featured in the Superman is a Dick website. Yep. <laughs> Because you could just thumb through old, like, Jimmy Olsen, Superman's pal kinds of stuff. And just find the ridiculously corny, horrible, like, 1960s nonsense. And they'd be, like, $4 because they're still worth nothing. Um, yeah. But I dug through there and found a ton of really old, beat up, like, Silver Age, total nonsense from BC and having a lot of fun with that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, Pinball mentioned Aladdin's Castle. My best memory of Aladdin's Castle is one time the old man and I uh, went in and decided, like, because mom was shopping and we we weren't feeling it. So we were like, we're going to be the arcade. So we went to Aladdin's Castle. We decided that day, we didn't care how much it cost, we were going to beat the X-Men arcade game. <laughs> and we pumped quarters into that bitch until we beat it. And we were like, yes! And then it started over. And he was like, oh, hell no. And we're, hey, kid, <laughs> you uh, you want to play? And he was like, do I? And he hopped on and st kept playing until he ran out of lives. But uh, no. Nah. <laughs> okay, I, I've never told you this story, but I just remembered it. So here's my X-Men arcade story. Um, no, it wasn't. It was Avengers. It was Avengers arcade. Uh, beat him up still. That was a good one, too. Uh, yeah. So... It was a trip to the beach when I was a kid. And we my my brother is like two and a half years younger than me and dumb. Um, you'll see why in a second. Uh, we went to the pier at the beach. The pier had the arcade. So we went there. I had like $10 worth of quarters because, you know, I'd saved my birthday money. And that's how being a kid works. And I'm like, I'm going to finish this game and I'm going to beat it. And so my brother and I went there. I, I go over there. I start playing it. I pick Iron Man because I decided Iron Man was probably the strongest in that game since he could fly and shoot lasers. And that's, you know, still pretty accurate. Um, but I'm playing my way through this beat -em up not at all watching my little brother. Like, I'm playing an arcade game. He can go do whatever. He has his money. Uh, my little brother played games, did whatever, got tickets, like, you know, like skee-ball or whatever. He traded his tickets for like a ring. Um, one of those little rings that you get for the points. I'm still playing. I'm like level, I'm like the fifth level in. I've invested like $6 in this thing. I'm like, I, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get to the end. I have no idea how long this game is. My brother comes back to me and says that it hurts. I'm like, what do you mean it hurts? And he put like the tiny ring on like his biggest finger and his finger is purple. Like the circulation is not happening through his finger. And he's sitting here flicking around his middle finger, purple and miserable and it hurts. And he's like, I can't get it off. And I'm like, well, figure it out. And I'm still playing this stupid arcade game because you can't walk away. You know, I'm like $6 invested. 
And like he's still doing it, and eventually, like he's making enough of a scene. I'm like, fine. So I walk away from my game. We go back, and like my dad's like, "What happened?" And I'm like, "He he's stupid. He put his he put a ring that was too small on his finger, and he can't get it off." He's like, "Can you get it off?" I'm like, no. And my dad couldn't get it off either because it was down here below the knuckle. And so like we're worried, and so we ended up taking him to intensive care, <laughs> and we get to intensive care, and they're like this is a dumb plastic ring. So they just took some pliers and broke it. And then it popped right off. And they're like, why didn't you just break the ring? And I'm like, I was mad at him. <laughs> Cause I didn't get to finish my Avengers game. <laughs> <laughs> and like, there's no greater payoff to the story. This is just a thing that I'm going to remember forever. Just being mad at my little brother. Well, he's over here, like worried he's going to lose his finger. And, like, my dad thought it was a metal ring, so he assumed we wouldn't be able to do that. But, no, it's just a cheap painted plastic ring. Sure. And they broke it with pliers, and then he was fine. Why did he put it on a finger it didn't fit on? Because <laughs> my brother's oh, dumb. Cause he's dumb. Yeah, right. Okay, I forgot that part. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. But that was exactly where my priorities were. Like, I don't know how long this game is, but I've spent $6. I'm going to finish it. That's just how it works. I don't. <clears throat> so I don't. I don't think the kids today really appreciate that sort of an arcade game story, right? I mean, when when I was a kid, I used to have uh, this little like leather pouch that was meant for marbles. That's how young I was. That I always kept filled with quarters, and I would carry it with me anytime my parents, you know, would take me any place in case you go into like, you know, a restaurant or a bowling alley or whatever it was, and they had an arcade game, and you could play some some games and then uh later on when i was you know in my early teens uh there's a putt putt golf and games near yeah. my house and my putt putt used to do super saturdays where you could go in and you would play pay like a flat rate like ten dollars and you could play all the games you wanted from like nine in the morning to one in the afternoon holy shit but they would only give you one token at a time so luckily what? the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game was really close to the counter. Oh my God. So you could play the game and you would die. And while it was doing the countdown to continue, you could run over to the counter get a token, run back, put it in. And then like 30 seconds later, you're dead again because it was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game True. and it was meant yeah. to kill you. And you could run to the counter and then run back. So I did eventually actually beat that arcade game with a couple of buddies at nice. super Saturday once, but it was only because we could just get, and I mean the, the guy at the counter knew exactly, he would just look at us. And when we'd start running, he would just start rolling a token across the counter and you just snatch it up. And run back. <laughs> Cause I mean, they, they knew what was going on. Yeah. That's awesome. I appreciate that. That's kind of done with swipey cards now. Yeah. But it, it was a different experience. Um, I'm entertained that places just have barcades now because they acknowledge that the only people that really want that experience are also old enough to drink and want to drink. Yes. Um, yeah. We have several of them in the area. I've but... only ever been to one, but it was a date with uh the uh, uh, Sarah. Right. That was fun. I was I'm yeah. like I've never been to this place. What is this? It's a barcade, and I didn't know what to expect, and it was. It was the putt putt golfing games that I grew up with, but instead of the golf, there was beer. And I was like, yeah. this is a strange experience for me. <laughs> we have a bunch of them in the area. Um, yeah, so in Raleigh, there's Boxcar. That's what we have here, too. Yeah. And in Chapel Hill is Baxter. Um, uh, what's the. What's the one that we went to, Chewy? Um, um, you and me, we? Yeah. Oh, Dave and uh, Buster's. No, it wasn't that. It was um the one in the mall. Oh yeah, no, Dave and Buster's is Dave in Buster. Haynes Mall. No, I don't remember a, the name of that one. Is it Round One? Maybe I have, I have zero memory called? of the name of that yeah. place. Um, places like that I've just sort of taken over. It's like giant game center type places where you just swipe a card or whatever. Um, and they generally sell booze because they're targeting an older audience. Um. Those are fun. Uh, it's a firm reminder for me as someone who in college got maim and played emulated games. 
that that button that I got in the habit of pushing that pot, but then more quarters is very different in real life when you're using money. Oh yeah. Because you, your actual, the way that you play changes. Um, when you have infinite lives, <laughs> you just stop being cautious. Yeah. And then you go back into a real scenario where you're spending money and you're like, right. Special moves cost health. You yep. stop using yep. them all the damn time. <laughs> yep. I, um, I used to love when we went to Pizza Hut in my hometown, not just because, you know, it was like the only pizza place in my hometown when I was young. I mean, we had a Godfather's, but uh, I meant pizza. So yeah. th they had a, a Neo Geo arcade cabinet in like the, the lobby. Yep. And so you could play all kinds of the, the graphics were just mind blowing. I played a lot of Galaga at Pizza Hut. They were. I played a lot of Ninja Turtles at Pizza Hut. I never really expect. liked the Neo Geo games because they were always too confusing for me when I was a kid. Like in arcade. Because it felt like I was just wasting a quarter. <laughs> I remember being fundamentally upset when one of my friends talked me into playing NBA Jam in an arcade with him. Because you have to put in more quarters at halftime. So you don't get oh. to finish your game until you put in more money. Oh, I've forgotten about that. I was so mad because, like, I didn't even want to do it in the first place. But, like, we each put in, like, 50 cents. Then we had to put in another 50 cents to finish the game. Oh, I was so mad. Yeah, that's ass. My 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 best memory from uh the days when, like, the parents would drop, like, me and Scott or me and Lomax off at the Putt-Putt. Uh, here's some money go have fun was beating being like a little you know 14 year old twerp and beating a group of uh guys in their 20s at virtual fighter 2 yeah i was never good at fighters but i definitely understand i was never good at fighters either but i was good at that one because i learned how to you do uh kagemaru's moves and they didn't know how to do moves they would just push the button and this dude had beaten all of his buddies and he was like who can beat me and i was like can i play he's like yeah i'll beat you next too and i knocked him the fuck out and, he and his buddies were like i thought he was gonna punch me in real life he was not happy with me and he put in another quarter and, and picked a different character and i beat him harder and, and they all left and scott and i were like And then we we played on that machine for a while until we gave up. But <laughs> I had, I had friends who got really good with the joke characters because I really like doing that um the sharking thing. Where they they walk up and they look like they don't know what they're doing, not for gambling, but just for like the pride hunt hit. Because mm -hmm. if you beat a person with a Dan Hibiki, they remember, <laughs> and they will remember forever. <laughs> because that's the point. <laughs> Like, they get really, really good with the worst character, and they act like they don't know what they're doing, and then they just stomp people with that character. Like, if they put use their skills with, like, a good character, they would probably actually be competitive. But no, they just find someone who's okay at the game and then stomp them with the joke character so all their friends make fun of them. And, like, that was the game for them. That's how they played, and that's wonderful. Yeah. I, I never got actually good at any other fighters. I was... It was I passable. Two D ones especially. I couldn't. I couldn't do shit on two D fighters. If someone else wanted to play, I was gonna lose. But I, um, I couldn't do it. I just suck with them. I'm awful at them all. Virtual Fighter one and two, I got pretty good at because I just learned how the moves worked with, with like Kage and like one other character. Who was the wrestler? Wolf. I learned how to do the big swing where you grab them by the legs and spin around and throw them, and people that just floored people when. I would do that to them, and they'd look down at me like, what the hell? And then Tekken, the first one, mm -hmm. I got pretty okay with the guy with the the tiger head. I think King. Oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah, King. Yeah. I got, I got pretty okay with him enough to beat a person or two occasionally. And that, that was it for me. But I do remember the Aerosmith game, Revolution X. Mm-hmm. That game was awful, but I played it a lot. 
Because it was yeah. Aerosmith. I pretty much always sucked at fighting games. Um, it's really not too surprising that I played a lot of one player games as a kid because anytime there was a second player who would just be so much better than me i would be like right this is what this is what two player games are so i just didn't do them yeah i played a lot that's what i in on itself for why i didn't get better too but uh putt putt is where i learned to love pinball games uh specifically the adams family game which is my absolute favorite and then the jurassic park one was my other favorite. The Jurassic Park table, uh... I, I don't remember much. I remember a lot of the Dot Matrix stuff on that one. I can't see the actual table in my head anymore. But I remember that instead of a, a plunger that you pull and let go, it had a gun that you would just pull the trigger and it would shoot your ball. And I thought that was cool as hell. I, said, I remember a lot of the Dot Matrix stuff, but I, I can't see the table. I know it had the Jurassic Park doors in it, because of course it did. Yeah. But that's all I remember. And that makes me sad, and now I have to look it up. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I'm looking at it now. Over, we can go to Raleigh, and you can see all of these things, because they have a giant pinball collection at the Barcade. Oh, yeah, and there's the big T-Rex head in the corner. Wait. Is it? Oh, God. Um, Is this it? Pinball, I have never beat an arcade cabinet game on a single credit. No. No, I'm not that good. <laughs> Either I'm not that good, or there was never a game that I played enough of that I could reach that. Um, I got pretty good at main games, but that's not really the same, because... You know, some of them you had to beat on one credit because some games are crap, like Contra. You know what happens when you put another quarter in Contra? You still start over on level one. <laughs> really? Terrible design. Yeah, it's awful. Huh. Yeah, the only reason that I beat uh, X-Men that time is because the old man was with me and he was determined we were going to beat it. So right. money was no object. So... <laughs> That is the power of age. Then I bought it on the 360 uh, years and years later f while it was available and played it again. And I'm like, man, this is so bad, but I love it. <laughs> I, I had a lot of fun when I was playing emulation games because I got to play a bunch of games that I never would have spent the money to get to the end of in real life. Yeah. Uh, but I, I did enjoy playing through when I did have that. Like the Dungeons and Dragons games, like Shadow of Mastara and all that stuff, were amazing when you could just pop coins in. Because then you could go exploring and doing weird, stupid stuff and not really worry about dying and losing it all. Because they're giant exploration games. And I yeah. think every time they've released it, like on more legal channels, you have finite lives, so like you still aren't really incentivized the same way that just pop the plus button to get quarters works. Yeah, I I actually played through the first one with uh, Jungle Rat Rob from the Retro League. I can't remember what the hell that one's called. Chronicles of Mastara is the name of the collection, and Shadows Over Mastara was the second one. But he and I played the first one. The first one was Tower of something. Tower Tower of Doom. That sounds right. I think so. That one was less. Complex. No, the second one's just better. Yeah, in like every conceivable in way. In all ways, the second one's better. There's more player characters, the map is bigger, the plot diverges based on your choices, Yeah, optional bosses, more weapons. It's just a better game. Uh, Pinball Eye of the Beholder was a, uh, a first-person game? Uh, yes, it was first-person. Like one yes. of those really It was crappy... one of the... Dungeon TSR D and D, yeah, yeah. It's by Westwood, and apparently it was from two thousand two. Oh, no, uh, that's the Game Boy Advance version. Okay, that didn't sound right. Yeah, I was gonna say no, no, no. That was much older than that. Yeah, ninety one on DOS and Amiga, ninety two on PC, ninety eight, whatever that is, ninety four on the Super Nintendo, and ninety four on the Sega CD. 
Hmm. Yeah, I just remember um, when we were maiming our way through Shadow of Mistara, if neither myself or my friend picked the cleric and we went to the hidden cave with a cursed sword that turns into the Holy Avenger after someone picks it up 50 times, well, if you're not a cleric and you pick it up, it hurts you. Oh. So it's just a weapon that's meant to be for the cleric. Because the cleric just like stands there and picks it up and drops it, picks it up and drops it until it turns into a Holy Avenger. But if you're like the rogue or someone and you do that, or probably the thief, I guess, at this point in history, um, it hurts. But if you've got the pop a quarter button, you don't care. <laughs> and so you're sitting there and you're like, ow, it hurts, ow, it hurts, ow, it hurts, ow, it hurts, die. Get back up. Ow, it hurts, ow, it hurts, ow, it hurts, over and over again until you become the thief carrying a holy avenger just swatting your way through zombies and whatnot for the rest of the game and the most direct pay to win you will ever experience how do you even find out that you can pick up a weapon 50 times and have it turn into something else being stubborn no i mean <laughs> how did you know that in the first place like Oh, my friend knew it because he'd watched someone who actually knew how to play it play it on an actual arcade cabinet once. Oh. And so I assume someone at some point in history found this out being dumb and stubborn or by reading like a guide or some nonsense. I gotta say it was probably printed in a in a guide in the back of a games magazine. Yeah. Um yeah. I, I don't know who originally found it out, but my friend found it out via someone that they met and told me. And so I'm like, all right, well, let's figure this out. And we did it, and it was fun. Um, but Shadow of Mistar is a really fun play if you're not worried about lives. Like, Likewise, going to fight the Red Dragon when you're spending money is just a bad idea. Because the fight opens with it killing all of you. That's how they establish the Red Dragon as a badass. It straight up kills your party. So it, automatically you're putting in quarters just to even fight it. Hmm. Neat. Well, you know, boys, this has been a lot of fun, but it is almost midnight now. I was going to say, we are knocking on midnight real hard here. So. This is actually what happened when we did odds and ends every week. We just skipped the first part. Yeah. Uh, and I still maintain this is a better show. Probably. So. The, the important uh, yeah. thing, everyone, is that if you're on the East Coast of America, there are 20 minutes of the last Monday of this godforsaken year left. It's true. That is true. That is true. I, I'm i all set for uh, hitting the top dasher status for DoorDash uh, next month, except for my acceptance rate. Your acceptance rate has to be over 70%. Mine is sitting at 64. That sounds like a trap. And I have to just accept whatever the hell happens for the rest of the week. That's awful. Dog shit orders or not. And I'm not looking forward to that. That That's awful. Like, on Sunday, I was like, all right, I'm going to dash some to make up for uh, missing Christmas. Because, you know, I didn't dash on Christmas. That, that's essentially a rate of how many things that you are given an opportunity to take that you pass on, right? Yeah, when you get an order, it shows it to you, and it's like, you want this or not, you have, like, 45 seconds or something. Yeah. And I took, I was gonna dash on Sunday to just take whatever they gave me because uh, I, I needed to get my rating up. It was at 65. And I got one order that was, I was in Kernersville. So for, for y'all that can see me on camera, that's here. And it wanted me to go from Kernersville to Walkertown and pick up and then take it to Oak Ridge for $3.50. It was like, uh, it was like 14 miles of driving for $3.50. And I went, was no. Was it the Loch Ness Monster? And and it and it was like okay now your acceptance rate is at sixty four percent. I went fuck, and I've taken every order it's given me since then. And it has not raised because apparently the way it works is it's your last hundred orders. How many of those did you accept? That's terrible. So, uh, 
the only way I the only way I can raise it is by accepting orders until it boots out a bunch that I turned down. Uh from a hundred ago. So you can look at your history of a hundred and determine how many consecutive orders you have to take to get there. No, I I don't have that information. That's even worse. Yeah, it's it's blind. So I I took terrible orders tonight because I had to, or else because the top dasher status really the the main perk is I don't have to schedule my shit ahead of time, mm-hmm. which is a nightmare because you can only schedule a week ahead of time. So like every day, whatever day, whatever time that the the new the next weeks uh, go live, I have to open it up and just schedule my time. And it's only a minor inconvenience, but if you don't do that, or or like if I'm like I want to start early, I fucking can't. So like if you get the status, do you have to like maintain that acceptance rate and whatnot? Uh, at the end of every month, it it goes. Did you meet all these criteria? You're a top dasher. So it's not like you have to keep it above 70. It's just at the end of the month, it has to be above 70. So like the last week of every month sucks. Not usually this bad, but around the holidays, people wanted me to drive very far for no money. And I refused. Yeah. Like, uh, there were, st- that one was the worst, the 14 miles for 350. But yeah. there were a bunch that were like, go all this way for no tip. And I'm like, you go to hell for no tip. That sounds terrible. Yeah. I did one today that was like six miles for $3, which is no tip. But most of that six miles was getting two Chick-fil-A. And then the order was just like a mile down the road. So I went. But still, like. Really, people? I have a question for you based on your pickup stuff. Okay. Have you noticed the correspondence between certain restaurants and certain like tip values yeah like, people that buy things from certain restaurants tip way better than people that buy things at other restaurants uh people who order doordash from mcdonald's around here don't tip for shit okay i will but, like most of the time a mcdonald's order is no tip or like a two two dollar tip okay but uh other places no i haven't noticed much of a a correlation like sometimes you just get lucky and someone is being extra generous and like i got a an 18 dollar tip one day earlier no the eight order was 18 dollars. i got a 14 dollar tip earlier this month and i was like okay. oh, oh i wasn't was sure for, about like a pizza things, like getting takeout from a restaurant means that people are used to the idea of tipping at that place so they give you a bigger tip versus like drive through fast foodie stuff or like you know fast casual doesn't get associated with tips i was just wondering if that seems to match uh other than the mcdonald's one that's the only thing that i've explicitly noticed and stored in my brain gotcha uh everything else is basically i mean this is gonna sound classist but it's still true it's based on where it's going i can see that like nicer houses give bigger tips okay that's not true bigger tips when you get them by and large come from nicer houses because they can afford it uh and anytime that uh, as i'm getting closer to a place i realize that i'm going to a trailer park i'm like well i won't get much tip here because i won't and eh. right like I don't, I don't mean that to sound horrible. That's just no, I, I get that's it. the data I have to work with. But like, and then sometimes not. Like I took a giant, oh my god, order of Bojangles to a trailer today, and got an eight dollar tip. Hmm. And nice. I took a slightly less giant order to a big ass house Mm, two weeks ago yeah i was like why do people that live here want bojangles like that was a thought that i had as i was walking it up walking along the long ass path to get to the front door uh and i got your standard like three dollar tip and i went right thanks i made two trips up your long ass walk to bring you your food for my three dollars appreciate you but (laughs) yeah 
Okay, everybody, if if you order food for delivery, just keep in mind that someone's doing that and make sure you tip them accordingly. Like the main thing to realize is how far away you are from that restaurant and how far away you are from things. Like if someone orders from here and they live here and it's just a couple miles, that's fine. But if that's the only restaurant nearby and everything else is far away, you better tip because I'm going to have to drive my ass all the way back to town. Kind of like a taxi. <laughs> like if you're if you're getting a ride to or from the airport, it's probably a lot easier than if you're going from up to other places. Probably, yeah. But like that's just that's just my thing is how far it is from everywhere and then how far that actual drive is and then the drive back. Like if I have to drive my ass all the way to Walkertown, I get mad because Walkertown is is a black hole for DoorDashers. And there are a few restaurants there, but once you're in Walkertown, that's all you get. But no one lives nearby the restaurants. Walkertown is like a little blip on the map, but like it's not the rural sprawl is everywhere. So any order in Walkertown is probably long as hell because Walkertown is just the name they give to this giant rural area. <laughs> yeah. It's where the zombies go. Oh, ah, I see what you did there. Yeah. Yeah. So, like yeah. pinball pinball, Witch is throwing out ideas here. Uh, and it's more than five miles from you. You always add more to your tip. Like that might work for where you are around here. That was, that probably would be okay. But I, I wonder if that was the new neighbors giving me the, please shut the hell up sound. Could or be. if they just you dropped something. Midnight. Could also true. just be the body hitting the floor. I mean, I did when I when I met one of them. I said, "Hey, I'm I'm a streamer. If I'm ever too loud, please, you know, just give me one of these." And I stomped on the ground. And he said, "All right, uh, do the same for us." I said, "Okay," and it's just a thunk 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 thunk. But I don't know if that was to be quiet or if that was just a sound. It's almost midnight, so it's probably good to wrap anyway. Yeah, it probably yeah. is. Big Blues is trying to escape, and he's sending that signal with his eyes that he needs help. Are you, are you like, batting out a SOS? <laughs> it's his idle animation. He actually disconnected a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be great. All right. Well, then we're going to go, because it's late as hell, but... I appreciate everyone coming to hang out for us to get together and just shoot the breeze about whatever the hell yeah. we wanted to. This has been nice. It's yeah. Been thanks everybody for hanging out. It was good talking to you boys again. Um, 2020 can go screw itself. It's Hopefully true. 2021 it's will be better. Hopefully. Yes. Hopefully. Right. Hopefully. I want to believe I saw a thing on Twitter that said, did you, did you notice that the way it's pronounced is 2021? And I went, no, it didn't. It did not win. You go to hell. Oh, thank you for the best pinball. I needed this and too, it turns out. I didn't even realize it. Yay. So, okay, but we're, we're going to go for real now. So I hope yep. everyone has a good night. Good night, everyone. Survive and the week, survive the year. I'll, I'll be back on Wednesday to stream something. Whatever that is. Yeah. So, okay, bye. Bye, friends. Take care, everyone.